Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is part C of lecture 5 on descriptive statistics and Islamic approach. In this lecture, we look at the personality of Fisher and his ideas. Uh, this is in conflict with the dominant tradition, which says that we should only look at the substance of knowledge and not at the personalities of the people who created the knowledge. It is easy to document that statistics was shaped by the by its use for eugenics a racist program and so the tools that were developed were developed to further the agenda of eugenics and the classic uh, for this is Donald McKenzie's work here who states clearly that these uh, associations were there at the beginning and they have continued throughout. However, the dominant view is contrary to this and it says that modern statistic is free of its racist origins. And uh, article reference here says that yes, initially statistics was shaped by eugenics, but it has broken free of these uh, origins. Fisher is undoubtedly one of the founding fa fathers of modern statistics and his personality was catankerous. He was ready to pick fights. He was proud and obstinate. He would never admit a mistake and he was stubborn in defending his positions, especially if uh, his enemies took opposite positions. Many of his theories were uh, developed just uh, because they were opposed to positions taken by other people he did not like. And he was very vengeful. If somebody criticized him, he would be become his enemy for life and he would not support him on any position regardless of whether it was true or false. Um, we will discuss some of the battles that he entered into in which even though he took the wrong position, uh, his position became accepted and continues to be accepted and uh, to much to the loss of statistics. One of the most fundamental of these is the debate between Fisher and Pearson who were uh, who became strong enemies. They would not attend the same uh, coffee meetings and uh, they would insult each other at seminars if they both were participating. Uh, the fundamental question at the heart of statistics is um, what is a hypothesis? When we have a data, we use this to assess and validate scientific hypotheses. Now, uh, we will discuss this in greater detail later, but for Fisher, the null hypothesis is was an assumption about the data that the data comes from a hypothetical infinite population, which is described by a few parameters. So he was quite clear that why do we make this assumption? Not because this is true in any sense, but rather because this is what is necessary in order to be able to decide, in order to be able to reduce the data to just a few parameters and to use these few parameters to describe a huge amount of data which, can, which cannot otherwise be handled by our minds. So in fact, once it is possible to handle huge amounts of data, as currently our computers allow us to do, then the entire methodology of Fisher becomes obsolete. This is something which is not realized at all. One of the techniques that Fisher invented is called the p-value and basically so you make these assumptions, make this assumption about a hypothetical distribution for the data which is has uh, completely no relation to reality. It is just uh, produced by our imagination. So the p-value tests for gross conflicts. Maybe you make assumption which is just completely contradicted by the data. And if so, the p-value will tell you. Uh, so this is the uh, use of the p-value created by Fisher to assess uh, gross conflicts between assumptions and data. However, Newman and Pearson took this Fisherian theory in another way and they uh, took the assumptions, the mathematical assumptions of Fisher as being the truth. And this is now the State standard position. And th for this reason, there was a huge controversy between Fisher and Newman and Pearson. 
which was uh, confused enough so that people did not really understand what the controversy is about. And today, this uh, controversy continues, but it has been suppressed and hidden. That is, the both Fisherian and Naaman Pearson views are currently in use, and it is assumed that the conflict has been resolved, whereas in fact it has not been resolved. So, according to Naaman Pearson, we start by uh, the, the parametric family that Fisher uh, introduced as a way to simplify the data as, as an arbitrary is taken as the truth. Then within the framework of this truth, uh, they developed very powerful and sophisticated methods for assessing which of these truths is the correct one and how to test different hypotheses. But the fundamental and glaring flaw in the name and Pearson methodology is the possibility of type 3 error because they talk about types 1 and 2. Uh, type 3 error occurs when all of the models are wrong. This is the possible, uh, and, and this is natural because we have just made an assumption from the air. This has no uh, connection to any empirical reality. We have just assumed, for example, that the data is normal without having any basis for such an assumption. So now if the data is not normal, then you have a type 3 error. This doesn't come under the purview of Neyman Pearson theory. But uh, once uh, you have a type 3 error, then everything that Neyman and Pearson do uh, turns out to be just wrong. One of the contributions of Fisher was the idea of the p-value uh, meant to assess gross conflict between a model assumption and the data. Uh, for various reasons too complex to discuss in detail here, this was turned into the single most important uh, scientific uh, use of data. Uh, this is because of Karl Popper's uh, realization that you can never prove a hypothesis, you can only disprove it. So uh, we took the Fisherian p-value and we say, okay, make up any hypothesis about the data. And if the p-value is low, then you can, or high, you can reject the data. You can reject the hypothesis. And this is the only use that can be made of the data. So um, you can never prove a null hypothesis, but you can disprove it. Now, what uh, ended up happening was that you can make up a large number of null hypotheses which cannot be rejected. Any of these hypotheses can be considered to be true. Uh, Name and Pearson methods don't do anything helpful in this regard because they assume the truth of the models to begin with. So all of these methods are useful for eugenics because you, you can prove almost anything. You can, if you are clever enough, you can create a null hypothesis which will not be rejected by the data and then you end up saying that this null hypothesis is true because there is no, no other way, uh, no other path to truth. Uh, Zeliak and McCloskey have written a book about how these p-values have caused a huge amount of damage uh, both in scientific research and in our real lives because they have been taken as the standard for how to do, how, how to use empirical evidence, whereas in fact uh, they do not correctly uh, do this job. One of the most damaging uh, failures of Fisher was the rejection of causality. Uh, Sewell Wright uh, invented path analysis, which was a correct method for, cause and cause, uh, for assessing causal effects. If this method had been adopted and grown, we would have had a genuine uh, field of statistics today. But Fisher entered into a battle with Sewell Wright on some obscure issue related to genetics uh, in the eugenics field. And because of this reason, he refused to acknowledge the contributions of Sewell Wright and also ignored many other important ideas regarding counterfactuals and uh, possible potential outcomes which uh, arose at that time. Because he was the founding father, his failure to endorse or to accept uh, these methods led to their neglect and uh, uh, disregard much to the loss of statistics, which uh, lost a language for 
assessing causality. This cannot really be blamed personally on Fisher, although he was responsible for it, but it was a general uh, philosophy of positivism at that time, which rejected all unknown effects, all, all unobservable effects. And causality is one of the things which cannot be observed in the data. You can only observe correlation. You can never observe causation directly in the data because causation belongs to the real world and is not directly observable. One of the consequences of failure to understand causality was the tobacco controversy in which uh, the huge amount of empirical evidence emerged that tobacco causes cancer. Uh, but Fisher refused to accept this and kept fighting against this, even though uh, there was overwhelming evidence that um, tobacco caused cancer that emerged in the time of Fisher. Uh, but basically for personal uh, reasons, also because he was personally attached to tobacco, he never accepted this evidence. And because he was so influential, the, uh, this delayed by at least 10 years the recognition that tobacco was deadly. And so the campaign against uh, tobacco uh, was not started until much later, causing lots of deaths by cancer. Islam teaches us many things about how we should pursue the truth. And uh, some of these basic principles are that knowledge should be valued as one of the most precious treasures of God. So uh, we should seek it with passion, with energy, and we should work hard to acquire knowledge because these are recommended and uh, these are uh, the attitudes and characteristics of seekers of truth that we are we have been told about in our religion um, we should be grateful for small we should understand that knowledge is a gift of god it, it it doesn't come from our struggle and efforts but it is given to those people who um, pursue knowledge sincerely intently with the desire to um, please god so we need to be, um, when we are given knowledge, we should be grateful for it. We should not be proud about it. And we should have patience and uh, because uh, knowledge is uh, difficult to get. And so every step is progress. And in every step, we should thank God and we should ask for more. Rabbi Zidni Ilma. So um, we should be opposed to the Qarun attitude. What Qarun did was he said that all of this wealth comes from my knowledge. So this idea that I deserve, uh, I deserve to get what I have, what I have, and the knowledge is my own because it's product and creation of my mind, this pride and this uh, attitude of that it is my genius, this is prohibited in Islam. Instead, we should have humility and gratitude that I have been given knowledge which is far beyond what I deserve. There are many rules about how we should pursue knowledge. And uh, we start by asking Allah Ta'ala to show us the haqq. Allahumma arina haqqa haqqan wa rizuqna attaba'ahu wa arina batila batilan wa rizuqna ijtanabuhu. Yani we should uh, we ask Allah to show us the truth and show us the error and uh, make us uh, follow the truth and uh, help us to avoid the errors. So a debate with someone else with the idea of proving that I am right and he is wrong, this is prohibited because this is just ego. In fact, when we discuss and we argue, this is supposed to be a cooperative search for truth. Together, we are searching for the truth. And we are not hoping for a victory, my winning the argument. Actually, the Mashayikh say that we should make dua that the haq should become clear to both of us and that it may the haq become clear, uh, b appear on the tongues of my opponent. Because if uh, I am uh, corrected of my error, this is an advance in my knowledge. 
So this is rather uh, different from the attitude that I should win the argument regardless of what is true and false, uh, which is the attitude displayed by Fisher.